This is Follow Friday, a weekly series where you drive the commentary topics. Let's get started. Team Gamertag. Hey Woody, I want to know if Modern Warfare 3 is bad, or if players are really listening to YouTubers, gun, equipment, and streak-wise. Well, Modern Warfare 3 has its issues. I don't think the class setup, the things that you pointed out, streaks, guns, equipment, etc., are part of the problem. I really don't. I think that if people start naming the overpowered guns, they name like every assault rifle and SMG and most shotguns. If you're going to say that, well, then the guns are balanced if they're all overpowered. It's a quick kill game, I'll grant you that. To me, the real problem with Modern Warfare 3 are the spawns. Uh, sometimes the lag compensation seems unfair, but even bigger, in my personal opinion, is the traffic pattern. So I've taken the liberty of drawing a traffic pattern for a typical map from a game other than Call of Duty or Modern Warfare 3. So if you think about Subbase, if you think about um, Overgrown, if you think about uh, Cracked in Black Ops, if you think about most of the maps in Call of Duty history, they fit this kind of traffic pattern. However, if you think about most of the maps in Modern Warfare 3, they fit this traffic pattern. And because of that, it becomes a really difficult game to play. It becomes a really difficult game to do extra well in because everywhere you go, there's somebody there on your flank. I was just playing Sanctuary earlier today, and gosh darn it, there's a line of sight on you from everywhere. And I'm getting killed by these campers who are just crouching behind these little you know, chest-high walls and at first I was like, oh my gosh, you suck. And then I got to thinking, actually, I, I can't blame you. Every time you move anywhere in this map, there's 280 degrees of which the enemy has to kill you from. And it's, that, that is the nature of a Modern Warfare 3 map as opposed to the old stuff. Woody, how long do you think it will take for people to get bored of Black Ops 2? E.g., Modern Warfare 3 took me until January to get bored of. Well, it's impossible to know, right? No one's really had the online experience for Black Ops 2. Even the guys that have played it, played it on a LAN. So, you know, that's a really different experience. Oh, hit detection is so great. Everything is so perfect. Right, right, right. You're on a LAN. I know. Put it on the internet and, and see how good, uh, how good it is. Anyway... What I have noticed is the trend, right? COD 4 lasted for almost two years. You know, people were playing COD 4 while World at War was out. World at War lasted a year, and then Modern Warfare 2 came out. Modern Warfare 2, I think by, like, summertime, people were kind of done with it. Black Ops, I think by, like, springtime, people were sort of done with it. Game comes out in November. By spring, people are kind of wrapping up. Modern Warfare 3, it feels like it was winter time, right? The, the game comes out in November. By January, you know, the, the hate's flowing in. There are a lot of people who, who've had enough of the game. And to some extent, I think it's related to the games itself, but I think in large extent, it's related to the fact that you've played this game before. You know, COD 4 was a lot of people's first experience with Call of Duty. Whereas, um, what will it be, Black Ops 2? You'll have already played this game for three, four years when you get Black Ops 2. It's going to be hard for Black Ops 2 to you know, last as long given all, you know, you're worn out on it before it even started. You know, <laughs> if you're playing Modern Warfare 3 right now, then, uh, you know, you're already pretty deep in, into Call of Duty. So how long do I think it'll last? If I were just to guess out there, I'd say as long as Modern Warfare 3. I, I think it'll last into the winter. Um, I think it'll be a a more polished version of Modern Warfare 3 that people will enjoy, but uh, it faces that uphill hurdle of, um, you know, being whatever, the eighth sequence in this franchise. What is your favorite feature in Black Ops 2? Multiplayer, campaign, zombies, etc. So I'm not sure if he means which of those is my favorite. If I had to choose one of those, I'd say multiplayer. But what he might be going for is what's new about Black Ops 2 that excites me the most. And uh, to me, it's the added emphasis on playing the objective. In my dreams, this changes things up a lot. It, it makes... For example, camping on the edge of the map in a domination game, not an effective way to get good scores, right? You know, it, it makes it that so that the guys who are capping flags, rushing around getting their defends are the guys that earn their kill streaks. And, you know, like, for example, if a defend is worth two or three times as many score streak points as a regular in, insignificant kill on the edge of the map, then everyone's going to want to be by those flags. That's, um, that's the deal. So my, my favorite thing is if they can actually change the way that people play in, an, in order to emphasize the kind of activity that brings wins, then 
like that will completely refresh the Call of Duty franchise to me. Because right now, I feel like on a 6v6 team, four guys are pretty much just, you know, selfishly going for kills and ignoring the game. They could care less. And um, if that changes, then Call of Duty changes in a really significant way. And I'm super excited about that. So, uh, so that's that. Woody, have you ever felt unsure about having your family in videos because of hate that anyone on YouTube gets? No, no. You know, we're way past hate. And, you know, like, I live on YouTube. So I think that, you know, like, I see hate and stuff. My wife and son, like, they are completely untouchable by YouTube comments. They, they, you know, it's rare that uh, that Jackie ever looks at them. And it's never that Colin ever looks at them. Uh, as for Hope, I sometimes worry a little bit that something, you know, could get her attention. But uh, so far, that doesn't really happen. So far, it's way more common that she's, you know, totally mature and, you know, like, just doesn't give a crap um, about this stuff, which is where you, you want her to be. So, um, so yeah, it, uh, not so far. Uh, I haven't been worried about it yet. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to, like, back down and let haters prevent me from doing the things that I want to do. Like, that would... That would really suck, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's almost like a a way of pushing back on my bully. You know, like, look, <laughs> say what you want, I'm still going to be me. You can't push me around, and uh, for that reason, sometimes I, you know, I'll continue to do it just because you know you don't want to let some jackass control you. Woody, I want to know everything about becoming a software architect. What diploma you got? Best parts of the job, and more. So, um. A software architect, for those that don't know, is a technical guy who also has, you know, he's, he's part tech guy, like computer programmer, he's part diplomat, he's part speaker, and, um, and that's what he does. Essentially, it's his job to take business problems and design software that solves them. And then in my case, I would also lead software teams during the development phase of it. Uh, I got the job, I started as a programmer and, you know, working for other architects, I suppose. And then after enough promotions, you become tech lead and then software architect. And before long, you know, you're the, uh, you know, the head man in charge, finding business problems that need solving, creating teams, and then, you know, leading them until the problem actually gets solved. Uh, the best part about it, I felt like, was my own team. Like, you know, you're leading a small team, and I always worked to be a guy that, like, you wanted, I wanted you to think, Holy smokes, I'm on Woody's team. This is going to be awesome. There's going to be bonuses all around at the completion of this project. We're going to have a good time. We're going to be like friendly towards each other. If I'm on Woody's team, then this is going to be great. That was the objective headed into every project. And that part I really liked. I always got along super well with my own team, and, and, uh, and that was cool. The part I didn't like was, you know, sometimes interfacing with other teams. There would be people who wish they had your jobs, who were just looking for problems all the time, not looking for solutions. Every solution that you propose is going to have some pluses and some minuses. And that's where that diplomat aspect comes into play. And there are people, you know, who just make a point out of finding flaws in what you're doing. And uh, to be honest, I, I really was good at my job. That's, that's just the way it was. I got promoted a lot. My projects were successful. But, um... Uh, you know, there were other guys, you know, who felt like it was their job to prevent you from being good, to find issues. You know, they, sometimes solutions are quick and dirty, right? They're cheap and they're easy to implement, but they have some like downside down the road. Sometimes projects are really expensive up front, but they should be, you know, successful and scalable and terrific down the load, down the road. And um, it, it seemed like, you know, there were projects where I proposed quick and dirty and they want the other. Then I proposed the other and they were like, what? This is expensive and hard to implement. And it's like, yes. Yes, you know, it, <laughs> you can't have it all. You can either have it be glorious and magnificent like a castle, or you can have it quick and easy like a shack, but you can't have a castle for shack ease of implementation. And, um, you know, that's, that was the kind of challenge. It, it, I, I guess the diplomat side, even though I felt like I was pretty good at it, always kind of wore on me. Like it was this, you know, draining aspect of my job. I wanted to be same team, all marching forward, happy and successful. Then there were other people who wanted to be like, you know, what? I don't know why I can't have a castle for shack prices. And um, that, that was the hardest part about the job. In terms of education, 
uh, you, you're this balance between a businessman and a, a computer programmer. So I had an accounting degree, an MIS degree, those are my undergrads, and then a master's degree in computer science. And, uh, you know, I felt like that was pretty much an ideal education for it. But um, you don't need all of that. There are other software architects who probably they usually run up through the tech side. So comp sci is probably the basis where you start with. And then when you do the job, you actually have to have your ears open and you know, listen to how the business runs so that you can solve business problems. So that's, that's the deal. You can learn the business part on the job. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like. If you're new around here, subscribe in the top right. And here's two vids you may have missed. Have a good day.